Okay, so welcome everybody. Thank you very much. Um, what I'm going to do is a little bit different from the other talks in that um, we've so far heard mostly about normative views of the barbarian. And I will quickly describe a traditional conventional story about the barbarian, what I'm going to call the standard version um, in Greek and Roman writing. And then I'm going to present a criticism of it. Um, so the conventional account of the ancient idea of the barbarian could go as follows, that the word first appears in Homer's Iliad, uh, probably composed in the 8th century BC, that the word is rare in Greek literature until the 5th century when it becomes politicised after the failed Persian invasion to the Greek mainland, that during that period barbarian meant, in effect, the opposite of Greek, that the conquest of the Achaemenid Empire by Alexander in the late 4th century and of the Mediterranean Basin by the Romans over the last two centuries BC provided context for a larger generalisation of the notion of barbarian, um, that some of those who regarded themselves as Greeks continued to refer to it, to, to use it to refer to all non-Greeks, but that others suggested, some Greeks, some not Greeks, suggested that um, anybody who had laws, cities, governments, and so on should be considered civilised. Some Romans appropriate the term to describe people who are unlike Greeks and Romans. And it then, so the traditional story goes, it becomes more and more common to treat barbarism not as a matter of ethnicity or birth, but as a moral condition that could be remedied. In other words, something that could be subjected to um, a civilising process of the kind that Norbert Elias described, uh, which also I thought was very similar to the account we had of Chinese barbarism as well. Finally, um, so the story goes, barbarian has given a new meaning in the context of the invasions of the Roman Empire in the 5th century BC. And then it's rather left aside uh, through the Middle Ages um, until it's rediscovered um, with the conquest of the New World when ideas of civilization and barbarism are given new valencies in the context of the great Columbian exchanges. Now, I put that, that schema very, very briefly, because it is only a schema. Um, it does, of course, illustrate some things that, themes that we've heard already in other talks, that barbarism is always described as the reciprocal of civilization, uh, but not an equal reciprocal. It's always a lesser, bit lesser thing than civilization. It always designates an outgroup, the stranger at the gate. Um, people, no individual people adopts barbarian as a self-definition, at least not with a meaning like our notion of barbarian, and that changes in the classical definition of barbarian reflect changes in the classical definition of civilization, whether it means Hellenism or whether it means humanitas or some broader sense of peoples who live in institutions, cities with laws uh, like those of the people who are writing the accounts. So barbarism shifts in response. It's rather like a dance, like a waltz in which civilization leads and barbarism follows. That barbarism has no independent history, it's always a dark shadow of the civilised. Um, in the most extreme cases in classical literature, barbar barbarians can be imagined as the polar opposite of civilised populations. Brent Shaw memorably described the Mediterranean um, ideology of the nomad as eaters of flesh, drinkers of milk. Um, people who don't eat wheat like we do. And other accounts represent barbarians as cannibalistic, um, as um, creatures who mate naked in the wild like animals, who are themselves halfway between humans and beasts. And just as in China, uh, there are also cla many classical concentric views of the world in which you have nice civilised Greeks and Romans in the middle. I'm not going to point them out because you should know where they are. Uh, but around them you end up with people like the Androphagi at the north, um, uh, you have the Ethiopians we've heard about, uh, Hyperboreans, so more and more mythical creatures. And around the edge of these maps, um, in many classical accounts, there are human-animal hybrids, uh, humans with the heads of dogs, um, and so on. So that's, that's the ideology, and it is only an ideology. The peoples who are referred to at one time or another as barbarians are, in fact, enormously varied, just like the nine bows are very varied, um, they include urban cultures like the Persians, some very ancient urban cultures like the Egyptians, oasis dwellers like the Garamantes, semi-nomadic and nomadic peoples on the steppe, 
Um, and as Eratosthenes put it, city-dwelling barbarians such as the Indians and Aryans and even the Romans and Carthaginians with their wonderfully ordered constitutions. Ancient writers are well aware of this diversity and ethnographic writing typically offered a more nuanced view than did rhetoric and public art. And my paper is converging at many points with that of Professor Kim and like, like, like him I noticed Eric Gruen's major contribution uh, towards... Uh, disaggregating the ancient knowledge of the barbarian. A more modern view of barbarians is offered by Walter ben Benjamin, writing in 1940, and here this is a famous quotation, uh, that there is no document of civilization which is not at the same time a document of barbarism. And just as such a document is not free of barbarism, barbarism taints also the manner in which it's transmitted from one owner to another. What... Um, what Benjamin is talking about is cultural goods, the products of civilization, and his implication is that civilization is always created at the price of barbarism, and he means not only at the price of other people who are dispossessed of their objects, but also as a result of barbaric acts by people who represent themselves as civilized. It's great rhetoric. It's probably not true for the ancient world. Um, when we look at the cultural goods of antiquity, the great statues, temples, um, monuments of the city of Rome, uh, probably most of them are paid for not by barbarians, but by peasants. Uh, peasants are more productive if you want to extract surplus from them. Barbarians are often rather thin on the ground. Um, and so although occasionally wars like Caesar in Gaul, which famously stripped out so much gold and silver uh, that the precious metal coinages of Celtic Europe collapsed immediately, um, or um, the similar brigandage of Trajan in Dacia in Romania, funded spectacular monuments. Th these were occasional bonanzas. Um, the underlying... Um, economics of classical civilization is extracting surplus from subject peasants, not simply by raiding barbarians. Now this, I told you, is a conventional view. And what I want to present in the main part of the talk are some objections to it, because I think this conventional view tells us only part of the truth. Um, there are several methodological objections, I think. Um, one of them is that, there were, is that barbarians are not the only opposite of civilization. That there are, civilization casts several dark shadows in different directions. Uh, there are peasant, there's the peasantry. Uh, there are bandits. Uh, there's women. Uh, there's slaves. There's cultural and religious deviants. And all of the civilization is constructed against a whole series of opposites. And barbarians are only part of that. And they are... Just as, they're not, just as barbarism is not on a par with civilization, barbarism is only a fragment of the things that civilization are not. Even when the, dis, the discursive field is organized around supposed ethnic characteristics, the barbarian wasn't always the first resort. Uh, secondly, there are many kinds of barbarian. Herodotus's barbarians are very varied. Uh, it's a long time since François Hartog showed how uh, Herodotus makes measure out of the distinctions between Scythians and Egyptians. Um, Scythians are the youngest of peoples, Egyptians are the oldest of peoples. And so the Greeks are located as a normal centre among many different kinds of, of deviants. So barbarians are much more varied than the civilised. Um, there are many ways of, of being uncivilised, in other words. Uh, Romans uh, expended quite a lot of energy on distinguishing themselves from various groups. Sometimes it was barbarians, sometimes it was Greeks. And there's a famous um, kind of human sacrifice in which Greeks and barbarians, are one, one Greek man, one Greek woman, one Gaul, Gaulish man, one Gaulish woman, are killed together. This is a sort of um, a, a human sacrifice but that leaves Romans as, as defined as the, the, the sort of normal people, normal in the sense of those not being killed. Um, if Caesarean ethnography was largely Borealist, as um, Chris Krebs has argued, um, Caesar also sought to distinguish among northern peoples, making sharp distinctions between Germans and Celts, probably sharper uh, than the ethnography really justifies. A major part of Herodotus' characterization of the Persian world and the Persian army was its disunity and heterogeneity as opposed to the supposed unity of the Greeks. Um, I won't elaborate this further. The second objection is to the way in which we approach this as philologists. Um, and as cla all classes to born philologists, and some of us try to outgrow it. Um, not all of us manage. Uh, 
I take inspiration here from the work of Christian Jacob, who in an essay he did for me on a quite different subject in a book I edited, insisted that we treat every individual testimonium as one fragment of a huge field in which most of the other fragments are gone. We're trying to put together a jigsaw puzzle. And it's very tempting to draw lines and join them to say, Aristotle is responded to by Eratosthenes, is responded to Strabo, and so this is one debate. But of course, it's simply three people, each one of them writing a couple of hundred years after the other. And there are all the lost voices as well that we don't know about. And so what I suggest is that we, uh, is that we admit the fragmentary nature of our texts, and, that we don't, and we don't try and make bad arguments from, the, from silence. In place of this intellectual history that takes all the testimonia as sufficiently representative and normative and joins them up into a single unified story, I want to suggest that we think about a disconnected or, or um, a fragmented barbarian. Rather than seeing the barbarian as... It first invented, then politicised, modified, resuscitated, abandoned, Hellenized, Romanized, add your adjective to choice. Instead of seeing it as a single process, I want to suggest that we start from the likelihood that barbarians had a discontinuous history on the fringe of discourses of civilization. Once devised, the notion of a barbarian turned out within classical civilization to be useful for many purposes and was no doubt deployed on different occasions for different ends, uh, humorous as well as um, xenoph as well as xenophobic. This is true of all histories of appropriation. Barbarians, I suggest, flickered on the edge of the classical imagination, sometimes visible, sometimes less, never wholly forgotten, uh, but often far from the consciousness of the moment. Let me sketch, then, this history of barbarism in fragments. Uh, Barbarophones appears first in Homer's Iliad. Uh, Professor Kim's going to talk about this and has read more about it than I have, so I won't say much more about it, except to say that it's conventional to try and play this down and to say that Homer's barbarians are not as barbaric as other people's barbarians. Um, it, it does interest me, uh, in contradistinction to Professor Kim's take, that carrions are those picked out, since carrions are actually quite loom quite large in the imagination of the Greeks of Homer's day, even though they certainly don't of the Greeks of the Bronze Age. The term barbarian uh, doesn't become frequent in classical literature until the middle of the 5th century, when it's widely attested in Attic drama, in historical writing, and in philosophical prose. They're the main areas that we find the word barbaros. And special attention has been given to Aeschylus, Herodotus, Thucydides, their particular usages of this. And Edith Hall is a, is a key figure in this, in this debate, uh, employing the work of Edward Said, uh, to create a kind of argument about barbarism modelled in some ways uh, on Said's argument in Orientalism, uh, a creation of an imaginary other by inversion, polarisation of Greek values. I've mentioned Artog as well, and perhaps we can agree that Artog and Hall together uncover a very unhomeric world, um, also a heliocentric one. Now, maybe the barbarians were really invented in the 5th century. Allow me to doubt it. Um, the reason I doubt it is we have no earlier prose before the 5th century in Greek. So how would we know? There was no early historical writing. And Gretlein and others have shown that historical writing really does begin with the 6th century. The poetic genre that followed Homeric epic perhaps don't provide many contexts where we'd expect there to be barbarians. Victory odes, wedding songs, hymns to gods and lyric odes don't offer many spaces for the barbarian. He could have been there all along, just not terribly useful for those particular acts of poetic creation. Um, there are no barbarians in Greek myth, no more than in Homer. Uh, we have a few... On the other hand, we've got, we have to cope with the idea that Homer's readers and Heraclitus' readers, and if you were expected to pick up on the idea of barbarian. So the words out there somewhere meaning something, and this is well before the Persian Wars. Bizarrely, the most explicit connection of barbarism with language we've got um, in, the, in early Greek of this period is Herodotus' claim that the Egyptians call all those who don't speak the same language as themselves barbarians. Um, now, you can do with that what you like, really. Perhaps the word barbarous was occasionally spoken in anger on colonial grounds in the far west or in the archaic Levant and Egypt where Greeks often rubbed shoulders as mercenaries uh, with others and with carrions who worked alongside them. 
The situation is complicated by indications that in the archaic world, in many respects, Greeks and, and non-Greeks work very well together. Uh, they work together militarily. Um, we find lots of instances of Greek tyrants making connections with other kings in the Near East. So Lydian, the kings of Lydia and of Saite, Egypt, seem to have treated with the tyrants of of, of Samos and of Corinth on fairly equal terms. So there's clearly moments of rapprochement or of détente, if you like, and there's clearly also moments of tension. Perhaps barbarism is something you say when you're feeling rude about something. Where I live in Scotland, um, English people are mostly treated very well. Uh, but if you, if you step out of line and there's a conflict for other reasons, people will talk about it as an incomer. Uh, most of the time it's fine. That doesn't mean there's an ideology of the income. It just means it's, it's there as a, available in the broader sort of cultural inhabitement, I suppose. Whatever its origins, the notion of barbarian as an inferior kind of human being turned out to be useful repeatedly in the 5th and 4th centuries. It's used by Athens to intimidate smaller Greek states and make them join their league. Um, it's useful for various programmes of Pan-Hellenism, uh, invented by Isocrates and others. It gives Spartan and Macedonian kings licence to go on escapades of brigandage in Asia Minor. It provides Aristotle with a purpose-made justification for slavery. Barbarians were terribly useful concepts to have around, uh, but that doesn't mean there's a consistent theory of the barbarian. After Alexander, the testimony becomes scarce again. Eratosthenes' view of barbarians was written in the middle of the 3rd century, about the same time as it pops up in Plautus's comedy, in other words. Um, I don't think we think that Plautus and Eratosthenes are doing the same thing. This concept is simply floating around a wider Mediterranean world in which most of the time getting on with your non-Greek neighbours is more useful than abusing them. It's possible the language of barbarism simply turned out to be less used from the Hellenistic kingdoms than it to be at some other moments, for example, in the 5th century, and then later in the period where Romans are conquering at the West. Quite likely, the situation does vary from place to place. The Macedonian dynasty who ruled Pergamon briefly um, in, the late late, in the second half of the Hellenistic period made their name partly through having defeated Gallic tribes established on the Anatolian plateau, in the art of Pergamon, figures like the dying Gaul and its companion pieces loom rather large. Perhaps this is a brief moment where barbarism is suddenly useful again. Uh, but it's quite difficult to find it having the same sort of um, prominence in other Hellenistic kingdoms. In Ptolemaic Egypt, and I speak here knowing that others in the room much more expert than I... Um, Quite a bit of energy seems to be involved in forming connections between Greek deities and Egyptian deities and creating a kind of hybrid bicultural state. Uh, maybe barbarism is less useful there. Barbarism is, is around in Latin, as I said, from the 3rd century. Again, it, it pops up discontinuously, but then our texts from before the 1st century BC are very few and far between, and not all of them offer really very much opportunity for barbarism to be deployed. We find quite a bit of it from Cicero on. Uh, barbarous is applied by Cicero to Syrians, it's applied to Persians, it's applied to Gauls, to Africans, to Spaniards, and also to Romans behaving badly. And it's usually paired with crudelitas, cruelty, with imanitas, savagery, and we have the same kind of association to bar barbarous behaviour with bestial behaviour. Uh, barbarism also imposes an obligation, as apparently in China I've learned today, on the civilised to behave better and to civilise the world around them. Yet here too there are variations. I, had, I thought I'd have a quick look for barbarians in... Um, if you like, one of the foundational texts of the Roman Empire, the raised gestae of, the, of, of, of Augustus, which, which a testament uh, or an inscription written in his lifetime to be inscribed after his death on a series of monuments. Much to my surprise, Augustus has no barbarians in there. Um, he mentions endless military achievements and conquests and explorations of the wider world, uh, but the people out there are simply described as externi gentes, outside peoples, which is a very neutral tone, or even just as reges, kings, or simply referred to by their individual names. 
Uh, this document and others like it, as Claude Nicolet has showed, uh, create a sort of a huge um, inventaire du monde, a huge sort of account of the world um, centred on Augustus and centred on Rome. And so it's rather surprising not to have either barbarians or dog-headed um, human hybrids in there somewhere, but they're not there at all. Augustus seems to manage quite well without the barbarians. Uh, maybe that shows how big he is. Later imperial monuments do have a different use. We begin to get these really fabulous um, barbarians made in polychromous stones um, in, in monuments around the city of Rome, including the Forum of Trajan. Uh, Bunta Barbarian is Rolf Schneider's phrase for them. Um, and then you also begin to get much more widespread images of um, barbarians being slaughtered. Uh, sometimes these are described as battle scenes, but it's always the Romans who are winning. These are always signs of barbarian subjugation. The, the figures at the bottom there, um, here, fighting up, trying to repel Romans, lying slaughtered here. This is from the Column of Trajan um, in the first century. And Pals Anka and others have shown that as the empire goes on, images of slaughtered barbarians become more and more part of the visual repertoire of empire. Here's the Column of Marcus Aurelius. They look even more miserable, don't they? Um, these ones have already been conquered and they're chained and slaves. Some are slaughtered, one beheaded. Uh, they're all being led. And the Romans, are, the Romans are completely tranquil and calm. Now, this impression of, um, of, of, of a continuity in Roman writing, um, in Roman art, stands in stark contrast to the discontinuous appearance of barbarians in Roman literature. There's long chunks of Roman literature where you get very little. Historical writing, Tacitus and so on, quite a lot. Many areas of Roman literature, not. But in the background, the visual representation of the empire, um, the barbarians loom very largely. This reminds me, actually, of an idea of Simon Goldhill, which is what he, his idea is that... Um, the literature of the Roman period, Greek as well as, as Latin, mostly represents responses to empire, responses by subjects, responses by the members of the ruling elite, or by people who are both. And that these responses don't themselves present an image of empire that comes from the centre. For Goldhill, the empire expresses itself through ceremony and art, and people who are subjugated respond in literature. So here you have emperors trampling barbarians, uh, on coinage, and I could have spent another half hour with images of this alone. And eventually it trickles down in a Zancaresque fashion into private art, the Portonaccio sarcophagus. It's not an imperial monument, it's a private one, but it shows the same sort of scenes of slaughter, and one side is slaughter as well. To conclude, I've argued that barbarians were invented at some point, although we don't know when, um, but probably within the first millennium BC. Um, and that after that, uh, they're deployed occasionally, sometimes for one purpose, sometimes for another. But there's never one, one view of the barbarian. There's never a unitary concept. There's never a normative barbarian. And that barbarians take their place along a whole series of other outsiders, of other, other others, if you like, um, as part of the way in which civilization and power project shadows onto the wall from their own better described bright light. Barbarian um, isn't an untranslatable concept like some ones, like some Roman and Greek concepts, like um, polis or humanitas or so on. It's very recognisable, and the papers I've heard this morning have made me see more, more and more resemblances uh, between particularly Chinese um, texts, but also the, 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 the passage from Biruni about how Islam has sorted the world out. Um, all the way from Andalusia to the borders of China and from the Slavs down to the Ethiopians. And this reminded me immediately of Pliny the Elder's passage about how once upon a time the world had been full of magic and human sacrifice. Uh, but fortunately the Romans, or the majesty of the Roman peace, is Pliny's phrase, had obliterated all that. And these, the, these views of the positiveness of, of empire seem to contrast with the fragmented, uh, disconnected views of its opposites. Thank you for your attention.